I have a new newspaper parcel. So this is a gadget that just came through the post. It is a itty bitty space modulator. It's a kit device produced by ittybitty.space, which I have just ordered. What it is, is a fairly simple little gadget for providing basic internet access to old computers. What it does is you plug it into the serial port of a computer and it uses a ESP Wi-Fi module to simulate a Hayes AT modem and you can connect to Telnet sites. Its main purpose is to allow old machines to contact internet-enabled bulletin boards. And today I am going to put this together. Now, it should be obvious that I have cheated and opened this up before, so I know what's in there. We have a small pile of passive components, the ESP8266 Wi-Fi module itself, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, these were originally intended as Wi-Fi modems, but it turns out that they were fairly easy to program and they've suddenly taken off, suddenly being a couple of years now, as embedded devices in their own right. They are absurdly cheap. Uh, this entire kit cost me about 10 francs. But the processor here is a 32-bit RISC processor. It's a bizarre architecture of all of its own, but it's got about half a meg of flash, quite a lot of RAM. Uh, it runs a proper real-time operating system. Uh, they're great little things. So uh, the way this works is the module plugs on here up on a socket giving it a little stand. Uh, this is the serial connector and the whole thing plugs directly into the back of your computer or via an adapter to a nine pin port if you've got one. The, uh, the RS-232 port does not produce signals compatible with the serial port on the ESP, which is expecting TTL voltages, which is 0 volts and 5 volts for logic 0 and 1 respectively. But RS-232 is weird, and the voltages it uses are about minus 24 and plus 24 for... Um, I got that backwards, so it's 1 and 0, respectively. 0 is the high voltage. So it also comes with this, which is a max 232 voltage converter, which goes in here. And apart from a handful of identical passive decoupling capacitors, smoothing capacitors, smoothing capacitors, uh, the, and a voltage regulator. That is all there is to it. Uh, there's a mini USB socket which goes on there. Mini USB is the less popular version of the small USB standard. It would be nice if it came with a micro USB socket because I've got more micro USB leads. Uh, yeah, there is nothing really more to say. Though it is a little bit interesting that it comes with a voltage regulator. Anyway, uh, I'm going to put it together now as uh, I know the design works. And then I will plug it into a real computer and see what happens. So there is one small modification we're going to make, which is... This Max 232 doesn't come with a socket, but I rather like my ICs to be socketed in case I screw it up. So I've got some sockets here. They are the wrong size, unfortunately. Come on. These are 28 pin sockets, which I got for a long ago pick project that never actually came to fruition. Still got the pick somewhere. And and obviously it is way too big for 
uh, this. So I'm going to cut it down to size. Uh, of course, I forgot to actually get my hacksaw and vice when I started the video. Be right back. Okay, uh, I also took the opportunity to look up the LM117. It's just a 3.3 voltage, 3.3 uh, volt voltage regulator, which is used to power the ESP. Uh, so the inversion is either done in the MAX262 and I was wrong there as well, or it's done by the ESP itself. Uh, the PCB is this rather cool uh, black coated job, which is re really good looking, except it does make the tracks a little hard to see. But the middle pin here is... V out, which is connected to this pin of the MAX232 and this pin of the uh, ESP. So both the ESP and the MAX232 are running off 3.3 volts. Uh, the MAX232 then generates the, uh, the weird RS232 voltages internally all itself. Just one of the things that makes it really useful. So, uh, the notch must line up, so we want the notch to be on the end we're keeping, which means it's, I just mark that with my thumbnail, it's that pin we want to chop off. Let's move it a bit out. This is not a very good socket. Had I had more th foresight, I would have ordered one the right size. Let me just double check. I want to saw here, so. Wow, this hacksaw is blunt. It's also quite loud, and as I'm recording this after 10 at night, uh, I don't really think I want to make too much noise, otherwise the other people in my apartment block will complain. That's better. Actually, before I... I should try and get the pins out first. That will make it much easier to saw through. So I need my... Favorite bent tip pliers. And that just pushes out. And on the other side. I should add that you don't need a socket for this. It just soldering the chip straight onto the board is easy. I am just paranoid, so I want a socket. There we go. Beautiful and elegant. Truly a pristine piece of engineering. Okay, where are my side... Ouch. I just stabbed myself with the pins. Where are my side cutters? Well, that was ridiculous. Uh, my camera didn't turn on when doing the last section of the video. Yeah, uh, well, what I did was I trimmed the end of the socket with my IKEA workshop knife, which is the same as a kitchen knife, except in a workshop. Uh, and then I soldered the uh, socket on. And uh, I reminisced about how old the socket is, which is probably about 15 years. Uh, 
Anyway, you're not going to hear that now. The camera is actually rolling now, so let's do the rest of it. At least it wasn't particularly exciting. So the next thing I was going to do is the USB socket. And USB sockets are dead painful because the pin spacing is pretty fine. And my soldering's not that brilliant. Now this board seems to have tracks on this side and the grounding plane on this side. The grounding plane, which is underneath the pretty black paint, is connected to the shield here. And I'm just going to have to peer more closely at this side to see if it's connected to any of these holes. So, uh, I do not believe it is, but actually, we have tools for this to find this out for sure. So grounding hole, uh, that's not connected, but this one here marked ground is, yep, yep, right, that hole is connected to ground, so that will be the USB data ground. Uh, as opposed to the shield. They're not quite the same thing, although they're nearly always connected together. And on this side, there is only one pin connected up, which is this one, which is power. This is only used to power the device because the serial port does not contain power itself. So I think I am going to make my job a little easier and only solder that one pin. The, the four big mount points for the shield actually hold the socket in place. So uh, I'm going to use that to hold, well, to hold it down and not bother with the rest of the data pins. So this will take lots of heat. This is structural solder. And quite a lot of solder. Okay, is that flat? Well, crap. These pins have bent. It hasn't actually... I'm going to have to take that off again. question is, can I melt the solder before I burn myself? Ow. Yeah, just have to bend these back again. But now I've made life really hard for myself because I'm going to have to get the solder out of that hole before I can solder the socket down again. Try that again, melt the solder. It is only one hole, so it's not too bad. Let's try and make these pins go in first. One of them was unfortunately the data pin I need to solder down. Yeah, these things are not really designed for humans. There we go. Just double check all the data pins are in their holes. So I just need to provide solder by heat here. Once that solder melts, it should all snap into place. Ow, or I burn myself. Let's try the table. You know, in hindsight, I should have done this component first. Uh, 
Okay. Right, that is flush with the board. It is held on securely by that hole. I don't need to re-solder it, but I do need to provide structural solder to the other four points. So heat. Solder. Heat. Solder. Right. And now the data pin. No, nope. I missed. Now I check to see that it's not bridged. I think that looks like a good joint. What on earth is happening here? There's a spike of metal sticking out. I think it's a, it's a solder stalactite. Yes, it is. Weird. You get some really strange effects sometimes when you have big chunks of cold metal and hot solder touching it. Okay, now let's go for the big one. This should be relatively straightforward. Again, I don't need to do every pin. Come on. Right, and that, luckily that clips in place firmly, so it doesn't need any support, but it will need an absolute shed ton of heat for these structural solder pads. It's not even too melted on the other side. Yeah, the, the big hole is only about half full, but that's fine. That will hold it into place. And as with the USB socket, I'm not going to solder all the pins. Partly because there are a million of them, well, 25, it's a DB25 connector. But also because that will make, that's better, just do that again on this side. To melt. There you go. But also, if I ever need to get this off again, it will make things much, much easier. The only pins which are connected are this one and this one, which is transmit and receive. The rest of the pins are all to do with other forms of signaling, dialing, handshake, that sort of thing, a lot of which are now obsolete. Oh yeah, and I do need to solder the ground pin. And I suddenly realize I need to solder the ground pin of the USB socket too. I think, yeah, let me get the meter again.
Oh yeah, these ones weren't connected, were they? And in fact, ground was labelled, wasn't it? It's labelled on this side, it's the one in the middle. It's this one. Right, this one. So oh, I need to solder this pin. And this little one here. And provided there aren't any other grounds on the RS-232 connector, which to be honest, I have no idea if there are or not. Let's stop being clever and just do them all. It won't take long. Let me check for flushness. Not that I can do anything about it now. No, that's fine. Yeah, I have time to talk about that socket again now. Yeah, uh, the PIC project that I got the sockets for, and I still have the pick, which I still haven't used. Uh, I got not at my current place of work, which I've been there for six years, and it wasn't at the previous place of work, which was Antics Labs, which produced uh, game middleware you've never heard of. And I was there for four years. And while it was technically at the previous place, which was Dow Systems that produced an embedded operating system that you've never heard of called Daos, or possibly Alate, uh, that it actually went bust halfway through and reinvented itself. And I got the help of somebody who was laid off during the great laying off. So that means that this would have been the first incarnation of the company, which probably puts it mid to early 2000s, making the socket, which I hacked up, about 15 years old. And I was a little surprised that the pins hadn't corroded to such an extent the solder wouldn't take but it actually went on really easily. Just interesting. It's not a very good socket. It's uh, the pin, the folded pin type, rather than the roll, the rolled pin type, which produced better contact. Come on. Here we go. Of course, the danger here is that I've now managed to short one of these pins to ground that shouldn't have been. But they all look like decent joints, actually. I think I got lucky. OK, next step. The ESP module comes with this little socket here, which goes on there. And this should be straightforward. Heat, come on, heat. It's not heating up. There we go. That looks straight. That looks like a joint. Not doing a good job of heating these pins. It's better. 
I think my tip might be oxidizing slightly, as it were. Also, I think the rings come loose. The ring here holds the screwdriver tip on, but I'm not going to touch it with my fingers because that would be crazy. There we go. That's better. Okay, so this module plugs on here. It's held in nice and firmly. You can see that's the chip itself. A couple of interface modules, I've no idea what they do. And this track here is the Wi Fi antenna. So the only thing remaining are the passive capacitors, which are all the same, they're all labeled 1047. And these are omnidirectional, so it doesn't matter which way around they go. And because they're all the same, that makes soldering them on dead easy. The only tricky bit is somehow managing to keep them straight. If the gods had intended humans to do electronics, then they would have given us more hands. That's not too bad. Just for tidiness sake, I want them all straight and with the labels facing in the same direction. Okay, and now I need to find a pair of snips. These are not my normal side cutters because I have lost them. They're probably right here on my workbench somewhere. I really need to tidy this thing up. Uh, <laughs> I don't think these are going to work at all. Okay, I think I'm actually going to have to go search for them. Found them. Okay, now we cut these off, put a finger on them while I do so to stop them pinging off everywhere. One day I will do this and then discover that they've fallen inside of power supply or something when all the magic smoke comes out or my apartment burns down, which would be a shame, that's where I keep all my stuff. Okay, don't want that wire. So we now have all the passives in place. We just need the one last component, which is the voltage regulator. And that. Make sure that's straight. Apply solder, apply heat, add solder. This thing has a hefty heat sink. It is straight. Next pin. Last pin. Okay. Um, also, do you remember what I said earlier about not being... Oh, that was my meter turning itself off. About not being clever. I'm actually going to 
do the other three pins here. This actually isn't as bad as I thought. Oh, there's enough solder on the soldering iron to do that one. Needs a tiny bit of solder. Okay, and cut these pins off. Come on. Okay, so I will now take it off camera and peer closely at it while I inspect some of the joints. I do not see any obvious bridges. Okay, I think that's good. So I will just use a cotton bud to clean the flux off because apparently he's supposed to do that. I only just discovered that. Cleaning the flux off is harder than it seems because uh, PCBs are sharp. I'm actually leaving traces of cotton on the wires. So, let's have a bit of a swab with the other end. And I think that will do it. And it looks a bit grim because the IPA hasn't evaporated. Okay, I believe I am now finished. Oh yeah, I haven't plugged the components in. So the ESP goes on here. The ESP should be pre-programmed. And the Max32 goes on here. Sure, all the make sure it's lined up. There we go. One assembled itty bitty space modulator. And if there is an earth shattering kaboom when I apply the power, I will not be entirely surprised. Right. So I'm going to do some tidying up and then I'm going to find one of my old computers with the right kind of serial port and plug it in and see how it works. All right, it's time to test this sucker. Here we have my trusty PX8 CPM laptop, uh, the most over-designed Z80 laptop ever produced. It has a serial port on the back with a proprietary pen out, so it comes with this adapter here. So all we do to make this thing work is plug it in like so, apply power like so. Oh, and we even get a red light in the ESP board. I did wonder whether there would be a power indicator of some description. Okay. Now we fire up the term program. I think we want normal. Well, we have a terminal. Let's try a T return. No, nothing. Uh, interesting, not ready. Uh, the serial connection at this end only has transmit and receive. So there's a hello exit. It should be shift F5. So, uh, 
CTS RTS handshaking won't work. So I wonder if that is turned on. All right then. I have switched computers to this Amstrad NC200, which has a rather more flexible serial program, and I've confirmed it doesn't work. So let us do some debugging and try to figure out what's wrong. I have verified that the uh, ESP module here is programmed. It was shipped to me programmed. So this means that the chances are that I have done something wrong when putting it together. In fact, uh, my suspicion is this socket here, which, because it's 15 years old, has probably suffered from some corrosion and may not be making proper contact. So what we're going to do is beep out the various solder connections and see whether uh, everything is making proper contact. So I'll just unplug the ESP module just in case. So we have the, the two serial connections are here. So this should be, this pin should be connected to one of these pins. In fact, I can follow the track. It should be this one. This one, I said. Hmm. Interesting. Let me just verify that. No, it's not that pin, it's this pin. Or even this one. Okay, and what about this one? Interesting. So this pin should be this one. Let me follow that track again. It's quite hard to see them. It's these two I care about. I think I've managed to get them muddled again. Yeah, uh, due to the way the light is shining off it, I'm actually finding it very hard to follow the tracks from this angle because of the paint. So in fact, this goes around this one to here. That makes contact. And this one goes around this one to here. Okay, so both of those two make contact. Uh, the next thing I want to do is to make sure that it's actually connecting to the Max 2C2 chip. So this is going to involve holding that there. Yep, that one. And that one, right, those are both connected. So what else could be wrong? Well, there's the other direction, which is from the other side of the MAX 2C2 to the ESP module, which are these two tracks here. Uh, so I think that's this one. Again, the same problem applies. Let me have a quick peer. Now, 
this pin and this one that's connected oh and this one okay and likewise I want to check that they are making proper contact to the max 232 yep and this one yep so there's power Power needs to reach the MAX-232. I know power is reaching the ESP module because we could see the power light come on. Uh, power is, I've done a terrible job of cleaning the bottom of this. It would in fact be better if I hadn't. Uh, that's the middle pin from the voltage converter goes to all of these and this one yep and ground is this one uh, let me double check that interesting Ground, you see, power and ground are usually on opposite corners of the uh, of a chip. So I'd expect it to be this. The ground. Uh, the ground distribution happens on this side of the board. It's this copper sheet here. So I suppose I could, uh, what I should do now is go and look up the MAX232 data sheet to figure out what the pins are. Okay, we've got the pin out. Uh, in fact, the pin out's from this angle. So uh, in fact, the it's not using the standard layout, so VCC and ground up in 16 and 15, so yep, that's connected. And power is the middle pin, yep, of the regulator. So that's here to, yep. So that suggests that the MAX232 is properly hooked up. So, interesting. What else could be wrong? Uh, capacitor joints? Some of these... I mean, they all look reasonable. For me, at least. We know the USB works, otherwise we wouldn't be getting power. Well, there is another thing to try, which is to hook it back up to the computer and then use a logic probe to check for activity. So let's, let's connect. We need to connect the logic probe up to five volts. Um, it should actually be five volts grounded to this, so... Okay, that turned out not to be as bad as I thought, but... Um, we now have the computer hooked up, the logic probe all wired up. We've got the 
pinout of the MAX232. So if I type on the keyboard, then data should flow into this thing and we should see activity on the MAX232 with the logic probe. And I believe that this one, oh yeah, so I can demonstrate that this is power, logic one, and this is ground, logic zero. So this should be data, data in, I believe. It depends which way around TX and RX are. Interesting. That one looks disconnected. Not seeing anything. Very interesting, actually. Now, there, there is a thought which is you do get two types of serial cables because you get two types of serial device. You essentially have master devices like computers and slave devices like modems. Uh, the infamous serial null modem cable is designed for connecting two master devices together. So effectively, it pretends that there are two modems connected in the middle. So you get two master sockets. Now, this being a modem should be a slave device. I think they're called terminal and something else. Uh, the the, the plugs and sockets on the devices actually correspond. So because this has a, uh, a female socket on it, my assumption is that this is a slave device and therefore I need a straight through serial cable, which this is. If this is actually a master device, or in fact, I'm wrong and this is a null modem cable, then the data and the data lines come out in different pins. So that is actually conceivable. So I want to get at the bottom of this now. Let's hook the ground up again. Somehow. Yeah, that should do. So here we have the two. Put this this way up so I can see the connections. Now remember, this is RS two three two voltage. Nothing. Nothing. So it's conceivable it's the wrong kind of cable. Conceivable, but, but unlikely. I have a null modem cable. It should have a female on both ends. So it won't actually plug into this. It should plug into one of these, a plug. It is also conceivable that the computer here is not generating serial data properly. I have it configured to uh, 308 N1 uh, there is no option here for CTS RTS handshaking So that is another possibility in that this computer will not send to the device because the handshake lines tell it it's not allowed to. This is what I think is happening with the PX8. I had actually thought that this had a option to disable that. 
So maybe I am going to need to switch to yet another different computer. Yeah, let's find a different computer. Um, I'll go for an actual PC this time. I was going to use my trusty Toshiba T1000, but it appears to have broken down, which is somewhat peculiar, suspicious and disturbing. I think the NICAD battery pack is fried. Okay, so fetch another computer and try again. All right. So here we have my trusty hacked Chromebook running Debian Linux with a USB serial device. And it's set up using the screen terminal emulator 300 board. And if we touch the logic probe to here and then press a key, you can see the light flash. So this is sending data to the module. And if I turn all this off and I plug the ESP module back in again and fire it up, and I can see data coming out very slowly, which uh, you can't actually see because this thing's got an incredibly glossy screen. But, uh, and then the camera just doesn't work properly with it. It picks up reflections from everywhere, but that is working. So I think this means that both the computers I've tried this on want CTS RTS handshaking, which the device does not provide. That's a bit of a pain. I wonder if there's a way around that. See, the thing is that uh, mo most modern machines, when you use serial, they don't use CTS-RTS. In particular, the very simple TTL serial interfaces that mi microcontrollers use, which just have two pins, which is TX and RX, with no handshaking whatsoever. The days of X on, X off, and SI, SO, and CTS, RTS handshaking are well and truly over. But the two computers I tried it on, being quite elderly, seem to assume that it is a thing. Hmm. Now, it may be possible to spoof the handshaking lines... Um, the Max 232 here does have some spare pins, so I should be able to easily make it produce the relevant voltages, and then I can wire them up to the pins of the connector. Uh, if I tell the computer that it's always uh, clear to send, and always ready to receive, then this should achieve the same thing as... Uh, not having the, as not honoring the handshake lines. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, the board works, which is good, but I can't demonstrate it on the computer I wanted to demonstrate it on. Let me have a think about that and come back again. All right, I have gone and looked up how hardware handshaking works. Now, uh, the, what this is for is to prevent the computer from sending data unless the device is ready for it. The way this works is when the master wants to send some data to the slave, it raises, well, it asserts the RTS line, which is request to send. When the slave is ready for data to be transmitted, uh, the slave asserts the CTS line clear to send. Uh, these are pins uh, four and five, so that, where's my pointy thing? Uh, this one and this one. 
if you don't want to have anything to do with hardware flow control, but you still want to support it, all you need to do is to wire the two pins together. So what happens is the master asserts request to send, and then it looks at clear to send, which it sees as asserted because it's just connected directly to the request to send line. So this means that modifying this thing to do this ought to be very easy. All we need to do is to solder these two pins together. So let us do that. I have a wire, that's not a wire, that's a piece of solder. Uh, a wire somewhere. Come on, a stray piece of wire, trying to pick this up. We have a stray piece of wire and all we're going to do is solder one end to here, bend it in the middle and solder the other end to the pin next to it. So to do this, I need the soldering iron, which is heating, some, some solder and something to hold the wire with, such as my trusty pliers. So I'm going to apply some solder to the middle of this. Try to apply some solder like so, and here. Like so. And just double check which pins I care about, which is these two. And just bend this here to make it a little easier to get at. needs to be held down. Actually, I shall just do a little bit of trimming first. Like so. Should really have some proper tweezers. Ah, come on. And in fact, I do have some proper tweezers somewhere. They're on my workbench along with everything else. Let's find something else to hold it down with, like a small screwdriver. Possibly a magnetic small screwdriver is not the right thing. Anyway, solder that end. Solder that end and we should be done. That looks like a reasonable joint. So, off with the soldering iron and then we get to get out the hardware again. Okay, I've got the PX8 out again. I've configured the serial port, plugged it all in. We've got the terminal ready to go. So let's fire that up. 300 board, 8N1, normal mode. Right, the terminal is ready and plug it in and see what happens. Nothing. Let's return couple of times. Uh, 
AC. Great. Well, it was worth a try. Okay, the logic probe is now is now enabled. Let's just try these pins, just to check. Uh, I have to keep the screen at exactly the right angle or it's not visible. Right, logic one, correct. Logic zero, correct. Uh, sh this one should be incoming data. Oh, -ho! blink and lights. Right, this means data is arriving at the max 232. Uh, which one of these is serial? Hmm. So data is showing up at the max 232, but I don't see it going anywhere else. I don't have the pin out to hand anymore, so I'm just going to try all the pins. Looks odd. That linear regulator is very hot. shorted something out. I don't believe so. Uh, this, this loop of wire is connected to the right place. Otherwise, uh, this would have failed and you wouldn't be seeing data arriving. Uh, the MAX232 is not sending serial data. So let's just unplug this, connect things up again. Just, let me just check the pins. Yeah, it looks like the ones I'm looking for are the four pins in a row down here. So we've got, uh, should be TX out. Uh -huh. So that looks like the max 232 is correctly translating data. So let's plug this thing. Yeah, we've got some garbage appearing on the screen. Let's plug this thing back in again. We do have a red light. I'm sh I can't remember whether we've seen blue or red earlier. So, Data in, no data out. The only difference is the ESP module is plugged in. Let's just double check that one more time. Data in. data out. Yeah, the terminal got confused and gave up.
Hmm. Oh, here we go. Success. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Possibly it just got confused for some reason. A T question mark. Fantastic. Wow, there's a lot of stuff here. A lot of stuff here. Anyway, let's just look at the settings, which should be this one. <laughs> uh, the speed dial is configured already. I think this is dumping. I've just seen that. Okay, anyway, let us try and connect. And uh, this is my Wi Fi password. I am going to pixelate it out. Let's try and connect to the Wi-Fi network. ATC1, connecting. Connected. That was amazingly painless. Okay. Uh, I want to dial the level 29 uh, BBS. Uh, ATS zero. No, Glass. help again. Uh, you can increase the board rate, which will improve things no end. ATDS zero, that's the one I want. Does control C work? No, it doesn't. Uh, right now it's set to 300 board, which is the default and pretty slow. Yeah, that command, $80 SB, changes the board rate. But I'm not going to do that just yet. Dial speed zero. Woohoo, we're connected to level 29. We are bulletin boarding across the internet. Eighty by seven. <laughs> Too dumb. Gasky. Excellent. Uh, this terminal program supports X modem file transfers using the function keys, so we can actually push. Pull, pull and push stuff off the BBS. Uh, I barely know how to use this, so I'm not actually going to bother. But this works. That's excellent. Uh, this computer will go up to, I think, 9600 board. 
Uh, if you plug it into a machine with a rather better serial port like a PC, this will go up to you know, 115 k ward or something. But most 8-bit machines don't go up anywhere near that far. Uh, and in fact, early PCs have really buggy uh, serial UARTs and don't like high bit rates. Uh, you can get them to transfer correctly if you try hard enough, but uh, most people don't. It's easy enough to upgrade the UART to something that's not, not buggy. Uh, yeah, well, that works. Cool. Um, I am going to contact the manufacturer and suggest that these two pins get wired together on the board in the next revision, because that will help things a lot for machines that require hardware handshaking. But other than that, this is a really easy kit to put together, even with my levels of soldering skill. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think, 3D print a box for it because this is a little bit frail. Uh, yeah, that's really useful. And I certainly can't complain about the price. So there we have the itty bitty modulator. Now finally working. Uh, if you're interested, do check them out. They've got all the designs necessary to make your own if you want to. Uh, and a few left from the current production run to sell. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.